Danielle Cook is a professional nutritionist and cooking instructor, and her sister, Adrienne Cook, is a gardening and cooking writer. We're excited to have them with us today for Braising, Baking, and Broiling Vegetables, a live online cooking demonstration. So with that, take it away, Danielle and Adrienne. Thank you, Libby, and hello, everyone. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Adrienne. Hi, everyone. <laughs> great to be here. Really good to be here. We're going to attack another great day of wonderful winter vegetables and all kinds of ways to treat them and to enjoy them this winter. Um, we so have a lot of information to share, too. We've got a lot of information to share. We've got a lot to cover, and we've got two great recipes, actually four, when you count the sauces on top of everything. That's true. Um, but I want to go ahead and get launched today on our um, vegetable confit of vegetables. And I'm going to be working with some parsnips and some carrots today. But I also couldn't resist bringing a couple of other really wonderful veggies um, that I can't do without in the winter. And I thought it might be kind of nice for some of you guys who are not that familiar with, say, turnips or rutabagas. And again, our trusted, fun, lovely uh, celery act, which we did a lot with last time right. we were here a couple weeks ago. Right. So I want to go ahead and get started on that. Is there anything you want to add? Tell us about just briefly what you're going to be doing. Boca squash, mm -hmm. which this is actually a relatively small example of one, um, but it's about the size you're going to find in the supermarkets. The uh, farmer's markets, you're going to get much bigger ones. One of my favorites, we're going to cut this open, see what it looks like on the inside. And then um, a couple of others. This is a, a probably familiar to most of you. It's an acorn squash and the top half of a pumpkin. The bottom half is in the oven right now. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So this is the hard shell squash made easy. That's made easy. Yeah. Yeah. Made really easy. Yeah. So for those of you who can't even fathom getting a knife into one of these. She's we got gonna, it. She's we got, got you covered. She's got you covered. She's going to go right in and show you how to do that without any, any hassle. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, flip our camera so you can watch what I'm going to be doing from the overhead. But what a concept, right? To confit vegetables, that's not something you normally would associate with vegetables. But actually, this is a really, really awesome way of treating them. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to just like change the way you view doing veggies. So... I'm going to actually start with some carrots and some parsnips. All of these really beautiful, I've got some really, really pretty ones that really pretty carrots, purple and obviously the, the regular orange, but then these very pale whitish ones. And um, I'm leaving the skins on because I am a proponent of not, not removing skins when, unless it's really kind of totally necessary. And the color on these is so incredible that you really want to be able to showcase the inside and the outside. So for instance, I mean, these are, this might not be a, such a perfect example, but look at this. And if you grow your own, I mean, what a beautiful, beautiful color is that, huh? The uh, dark and the purple and then the bright yellow on the inside. So I'm going to do just uh, big wedges and, uh, the, for the thinner parts of the carrot, I'll just go just in half. And I really like doing lots of color, right? As much color as you can possibly get in your diet is really the way to go. These come also in all red all the way through, you know. I, the, the ones that I got were, were all red. But I love this dual color one. Yeah. The, or the yellow on the inside. So the pretty. The so pretty. I'm going to grab another orange. Get rid of the ends. So the idea with this confit, with these veggies, um, is you can use, you can do this method with just about any kind of vegetable. And it's something you could do really year round, but it's, to me, it lends itself more as a, as a winter option because this is a slow braise is what we're essentially gonna be doing to these, to these vegetables, is giving them a slow braise in the oven with, olive oil and seasonings. Now I'm going to add into this dish, I'm going to add parsnips. And I'm doing the carrots and the parsnips together because texture wise they are pretty close and so they're going to cook at pretty at the same rate. 
um, if you were to use other vegetables, you would need to think about whether or not the, the other vegetables you choose are gonna work together in terms of how long they're gonna cook. Uh, if they're all gonna cook at the same rate, that is what I mean. So that's, the, with these two in particular, these work well together to be able to put them, to cook them together. When we get into some of these other ones, um, you would want to have those in a separate pan because, the, again, because of the density of the vegetable would lead to a different uh, length of time that they need to cook. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, Danielle? Uh, yeah? Uh, we've had a question about the cutting implement you were using. This person <laughs> noticed that you're using a sort of a hatchet looking uh uh, implement instead of a knife to cut the vegetables. Do you recommend that sort of instrument for cutting these sorts of vegetables? Um, I would recommend you go with whatever your comfort is with uh, with knives. I have, as you can see here, I've got a whole litany of different things that I have on hand today because we're going to be doing different, besides the cutting, uh, we're going to be doing some paring. And so my comfort is when I've got something this this big I do like this bigger knife. Um, I think it's got it just got I get better control over the cuts with it. But that said, and I actually got this at one of these um, Asian markets. They have some really awesome, uh, inexpensive but really good. I've had this knife for probably fifteen years or more, and it just it doesn't get dull, um, and it works really well. So I yes, that is my personal preference. But you know, something even this size would work pretty well on just fine on carrots. Um, as we get into these bigger ones, though, I I do I do prefer a heavier or you know these heavy French knives, uh, butcher, uh, uh, chef's knife. Yes, or chef's a, knife yeah. is good too. Yeah. Okay, so we have um, the carrots are now cut up, and I'm going to switch my attention. We're going to dress these in a minute, but I'm going to switch over and do a few pieces, a few chunks of some of these other veggies that I've got. So let's start with a piece of celery, celery root. This is celery act. This is the root, the top. The top. That's the, the root. Yeah, this is the root. And this celery, celery root is grown for its root. It is not the same thing as celery that you cut, the stalks that you cut and munch on. That is a cousin variety of this. It could be, but it's much uh, harder and more, a lot more fibrous than the celery that we grow for the celery tops. Uh huh. Right. Okay. So here's here's what I mean. I've I've lobbed off a nice chunk. I'm not going to use that knife um, for clearing the skin. I'm going to go with a smaller paring knife because I have more control. And this is just me personally. You know, there's no right or wrong. You could even. Uh, Theoretically, go at this with a vegetable peeler, but it's pretty. It's it's going to be pretty labor intensive to to just keep peeling back and peeling back. That's why I like using a paring knife, and you want to get around all these little root points. Nodules. No, lots of nodules on these. Lots and lots of nodules. And then, um, in terms of what kind of size you want to cut for your uh, chunks or your slices is really totally up to you. Um, I actually, I think what I'm gonna do on this one is gonna be similar to what I've already cut. I've already cooked one batch, which you're gonna see. And I'm gonna do slices, which is kind of something a little bit different. Not something you necessarily associate with uh, celery root. You know, usually these are chunked and put into stews. So let's do this. So what is a confit? Cool so what is a quilfi? It's a good question. A quilfi actually just refers to the method of cooking. And it, it, it basically means uh, vegetables or more commonly, the most com more commonly, meats and um, poultry, like yeah. duck quilfi. It, it refers to the method of slow, slow braising, slow cooking. In fat, right? In, in a liquid. And we know it most, most like I said, most common to us is in uh, the duck in duck fat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you were to do fruit confit, you would be braising it in a liquid like a syrup. 
Ah, I see. So that um, doesn't fit you. Right. So that doesn't necessarily, cold feet does not necessarily mean it has to be done in a fat. Ah. It's just a method. And then whatever you are confeeing is usually then stored in that liquid. And that's like, uh, it preserves it in effect. Absolutely. The duck, I know the duck, the, the, the duck will see is preserved in the fat and you can get it um, for, I mean, it keeps for sometimes weeks, right? Oh, sure. I mean, when you, you know, when you get these uh, in the jar, the jar duck confit. Right. I mean, that's that can even stay on your shelf more than weeks. You can hang on to that. So, like, I mean, I don't know that you would keep it for years, but you could keep it for a couple of years. I've, I've done that, these large tins of duck confit that I don't get around to using one winter. Mm -hmm. It sits around for another year. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and add rutabagas. This is what I was working on next. Rutabagas, again, another underserved uh, root vegetable. Nice kind of um, flavored, sort of between a turnip and um, turnip and a potato, really. It's sweeter than a turnip. Yeah, it doesn't have the bite. But here we go with the turnip. So we're going to do that next. Again, um, I'm just doing a, ch a chunks of this so you get the idea. And then this one, I'm going to actually use a peeler because the skin is quite thin. I'm going to go ahead and peel this. And I'm keeping these all together because they're one happy family, these guys. And they can all cook at the same, they'll cook at the same rate. They'll actually come along, they'll be, they'll get cooked in the braise, in the olive oil braise. They'll cook faster than, um, than the carrot and parsnip counterparts. So, again. Totally up to you. You could do big chunks of this. You can do slices like what I'm doing. Really, really up to you. And now, what you want to have them, you want to get your veggies quite snugly together um, in, your, in your pan. And I'm going to add lots of garlic. I've got some several cloves of garlic that I've sliced. So I'm going to pack that in there. I'm gonna take some of these and yeah. pack the. Think I'm gonna do it. Be able to do it right. I think you can do it right. Can you? Can you? Yes. <laughs> I'm not gonna scold you. <laughs> and then I've got. Um, I just picked from the garden um, some beautiful rosemary and and um, thyme. So Adrian, I'm gonna give you the thyme, and I want you just to just to you know try to pull some some uh, sprigs and just. Tuck it, tuck it around there. But you're okay with them being whole. Yes, I want them whole. You want them whole. And then I'm going to do the same, and I'm this flavoring is going to be rosemary. Now this is an important uh, step in that the oil, since we're going to be using a fair amount of it, is going to be then infused with. You want me to put some time on yours? No, you're just going to keep them separate. I'm going to keep them separate. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Um. I like the idea of the these this these root vegetables being paired with rosemary, but thyme would be just fine. You know, you don't have to run out and get rosemary just for this. So thyme would be great, or a mix of you know some bay leaves. But you want something that's going to have some flavor. That looks enough. that looks great. Thank you. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. So last little round here is. We're going to give it a sprinkling of salt so that the moisture is that like um, kosher salt? It's just kosher salt. Okay. And not much, you know, quarter yeah. to a half a teaspoon. Right. Okay. And then the fun begins with lots of olive oil. The top of the olive oil goes right in there. Yes, that gives it <laughs> great flavor. You need for each, depending on how how big your pan of vegetables are, you're gonna need one to two cups of olive oil, which I know that sounds like an exorbitant amount of olive oil, but here's the thing. These vegetables, they're gonna braise in a very slow oven at 300 for one hour. You would be surprised how much oil remains after you've braised them. And this oil is going to be incredibly delicious and helpful in other dishes. You're not going to be eating all this oil. This is just 
the conduit to getting these cooked. You can bottle it up and give it as flavored oil for Christmas gifts. There you go. Okay, now we're gonna wrap these tightly in foil. Tightly in foil, okay? You want them well covered. And then they're gonna go, do the other one, and then they're gonna go into the oven. As I said, a slow oven of 300, 300 degrees for an hour. And then check them after an hour and poke them with a knife and they should be quite tender. At which point, at which point they will be ready. Okay, so that goes off to the side. I can the oven in just a second. And now, Can you tell me how to do the broiler real quick before you somewhere? What's that? The broiler? Want it on? Yeah. And there we go. Thank you. Broil. Okay. And now we're going to put together our finished platters. And I will show you. This is what I did earlier. Isn't that just gorgeous? These are this, the, you can see the color scheme of all the different carrots and then my parsnips off to the side. Smells great. Doesn't it smell? It, it smells, smells heavenly. Mm. And then the other tray that I did is also the, just like what we just did now with the parsnips and celery root slices. So what I like to do for the presentation. So Danielle, was that other pan, that other pan was the turnips and celery slices, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we don't need, yeah, that's all that in there. We're gonna get rid of all the nice sticks and stems. And then with a slotted spoon, because we don't want the oil, we don't need all that oil, it's done its job. But what it's done is it's gonna make these, the, the vegetables just luscious and yet they still hold their shape just fine. It's not like they're, they're oversaturated. So these are all nice and cooled down. And I'm just gonna line them however you like. You can mix them all up. I'm gonna actually keep keep some of them. I'm gonna keep the parsnips separate so you can see the difference there. This is a parsnip. Did you warm them up before you serve them? You can serve them warm. You can serve them room temperature. And if you're not gonna use them right away, you can keep them in the oil and refrigerate them for several days because they will stay, um, they will stay you know, well preserved in the oil. But I actually remove the, I just get them out of the oil when they're done and just um, don't the, you store know. them without the oil around it. Correct. I got it. And then you, up to you if you want to keep all those, the many um, slices of garlic, you can remove some if you want. I like to keep it, put, uh, just let it sit in the oil for a little bit longer and continue to infuse. I think you need to get that out. Okay. And I'll switch these. I'm gonna use, see, you've got a tremendous amount of oil still left on there. And that is all good because we're gonna put it in a jar and we're gonna, I'm gonna be using it in the, over the course of the next several weeks. And now the other root vegetables. Lift those out. Isn't this so pretty? We're almost, we're almost all done. These are wonderful, just, just like this. But you can also just finish them off with a little dressing if you like. Put that aside. I have one other thing I wanted to show you that I haven't even talked about. But I have even done little baby beets. And that's what's in here. And I did those. A couple days ago, I'm not gonna be able to reach in there with that. Let's see. Can you give me a fork? Yeah. And I have red beets and little purple beets in here. So let's 
try to fish some of these out and add those as well. And these I did, the red and the purple, I cooked them. I just, they were beautiful little baby ones from the market. See, look just like really, really pretty. And that adds also color. I mean, these are all the warming colors of winter that we've got going on here. Um, the gold beets, I've got gold beets and purple beets. Just add some of that. And this is kind of pretty because the, the purple, the, it's a gold beet, but it was grazing next to the red, the red beet. So it's got kind of this rainbow color going on. It's an ombre, an ombre beet, yes. So you get you get the idea of how versatile these the the this this cooking process is with any number of different winter winter vegetables. So you're not you're not limited. You can even you can braise fennel, you can braise uh, leeks this way. What about um Oh yeah, leeks and, and also uh, scallions, right? Yeah, I mean any sure, red absolutely. Red onions. Mm -hmm. Red onions. Spice Excuse me, I have not done red onions, but I don't see why you couldn't. Swiss red onions are just pickled so they, they, they're so good pickled that maybe you'd want to stick with that. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay. Look at that. Isn't that so pretty? Colors. I That's know. Beautiful. Okay, so my last step now is gonna be to go ahead and do a nice dressing to go on this. And as I said. You can just garnish this with some parsley um, and serve it as is. Or if you want, you can do a dressing. And that's what we're going to work do today. We're gonna to do a dressing that's going to have a combination of some parsley. And this is all on your on the recipes. So I'm not I'm not creating any surprises for you guys here. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of garlic, little just a little clove of garlic, very small because this has been braised in uh, the the oil has had a lot of garlic, so I don't want to overpower that. And some fresh cilantro, and to kind of contrast the the as the fat content in here, the, the the creaminess, we're gonna mix some apple cider vinegar into the dressing. So I'm going to whiz that. My little spatula. Around here. So Danielle, we can't see what you're doing right now. So are you using a blender to, to put that sure. together? Yep. We can do that. How's that? Better? Much better, yes, thank you. Sure. Okay, and then I'm gonna leave this kind of a little bit chunky on purpose. And then here is some of the reserved oil from the previous batch that I that I raised, and we're going to use that in the dressing. And maybe a little pinch of salt, since we haven't done that yet. Oop, a nice pinch. There we go. So, so you, it's, you, it's mm -hmm. a thick dressing. I like it. I like the thick. I like the sort of the, the not the crunch, but the texture of the, of having the, of the parsley. Um, and then I've got also some jalapeno peppers, which I've thin sliced. And you could add that into there and, and grind it up fine if you like. But again, I'm, I'm doing this because these, the texture is so great, and you know that's an important component when you're cooking and you're pulling dishes together. Is not only the color, but the texture. And these, the vegetables are so luscious and 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 creamy and soft, but they they still retain their their um, texture. So now we're gonna just 
amp it up a little bit with a little bit of spice from the jalapenos. You can use Fresno, pretty red Fresnos if you want. And, um, and a little bit of, you know, the acidity from the vinegar and, and just a little pop of herbs in the cilantro. You could use dill, dill would be great in this. Um, but we got some cilantro, which actually works with the family members of some of these other yeah, vegetables, that's right? right? Cilantro and dill, both. Yeah, exactly. You could also go fresh oregano, which would be delicious. That would be good. Yeah. Okay, I think we're good here on that. Okay. So, what do you think? Do you want to just show this because I think this is really interesting. This is the uh, this is the oil. That's how. This is the this is the oil that it remained and there's um I pulled off I think there's let me just there's a tiny bit of uh of the garlic, garlic left but I removed the bulk of the garlic from this um because uh you know if in, when you store this oil which you you would store it in the refrigerator if you're not going to use it very regularly for the next week. If you don't think you're going to go through it, because it's got the garlic in it, it needs to be stored in the fridge. But I've actually removed um, the, most of the roasted garlic because garlic and oil are not a great combination. When they're stored at room temperature, they can, it can bring on botulism. So you need to be aware of that. So, um, but that is the gar the used oil for that was used. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, and all the little bits of herbs that are in there is wonderful. Exactly, yeah. and I've got um, you know, I've got a really good olive oil, really good Greek olive oil that I've used. So, here's our finished platter. Look at that. It looks and beautiful. It looks like enough for like eight people, I know. But um, this is a great way of getting some wonderful veggies into your diet really great veggies into your diet. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and um, take any questions that you might have, and we're gonna get reset and answer your questions at the same time, because yeah. Adrian's up next. <laughs> so so uh, first off, how long will that oil last, um, the flavored that, olive oil you created? That, that's a great question. That oil uh, will be fine for a, you know three or four weeks easily. Um, I think you will find um, that, yeah, just off to the side for right now. I think you will find that if you are, if you have it on hand, you'll use it a lot. I mean, think for instance, how many times during the, the during the week, are, do you reach for a pan and throw a little olive oil in there to saute some onions and garlic? Well, now you've got a great use, reason to use this, but you can certainly keep it, you can keep it for three or four weeks easily in the refrigerator. So continuing with the garlic discussion, um, someone in the chat, they said they can't use garlic in their house. Um, would shallots work as a good substitute in this recipe? Absolutely, shallots would be just fine. That'd be lovely, because you do want to try to get that allium, the onion flavoring into the dish in, in some manner. It really does make an, a difference, but shallots would be great. Um, there was a question, does this method work with any sort of low carb vegetables as well? Or does it really have to be like a super starchy root vegetable? No, no, you can do this method with with anything. You can do it with zucchini. Um, you know, you wouldn't need an hour in the oven, but you can do it with, we've done it with tomatoes uh, in the summer, with cherry tomatoes, um, fennel. Um, the parsnips are nice because, you know, they're not super starchy. Um, and, uh, you know, they've got a great, they're a great source of, of vitamin, vitamin B vitamins and minerals. And they're like a, not unlike a potato, only even better for you. You could even use some of these squashes, couldn't you? Yeah, you could. Yeah. You could. I think it's great for, um, for the winter vegetables because they've got a lot more density to them than, than the summer vegetables. That's right. Although I think zucchini would work just fine. Zucchini and yellow squash would be fine. Yeah, yeah. You, you'd need to do fairly thick slices yeah. of it. I mean, I wouldn't do that this time of year. I would really, which is why we're here is to really, you know, showcase the winter vegetables and encourage you to experiment. And if you've never had a rutabaga, um, give this method a try. And if the celery root has always been intimidating and scary to you, um, here's a great way you can use it, try it. And, um, it won't fight back, I promise. <laughs>
there was also a question about Brussels sprouts. Could you use Brussels sprouts with this recipe? Yes, you could. Okay. You really could, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then what if you use dried herbs instead of fresh herbs in this recipe? Would it work as well? Um, it would because the oil will really, uh, you know, the oil will reconstitute the dry, the, the, the dry herb. In fact, um, the jar that I, the oil that I showed you a few minutes ago, uh, that is thyme from my garden that actually had, I had dried a, a bundle of thyme and I just used the little leaves from the bundle. So it did come back and it, it just infused the oil beautifully. So using dry is fine. And uh, there have been a couple questions about potatoes in this recipe. So if you're um, gonna use potatoes, would they cook with the carrots or with like the celery root for sort of baking, the braising purposes? Um, I would do them, if you're gonna do them with uh, one of those, I would choose the celery root over the carrots. I think texture wise, they're gonna be closer to that. And I think Yukon gold and celery Celery app would be a great combination. That would be, yeah. yeah. It's not unlike what I did with the the uh, rutabaga. Is is not. It's kind of like that cross between uh, a turnip and a Yukon Gold, really. So yeah. What okay, else? and then one more question, and then we'll um, jump into the next recipe. But there was a, a question about the the different carrots that you were using. And um, this person was like, there's a vegetable that looks like a black carrot, but I think that's the purple carrot. Is that correct? That's, that's all the different types of carrots? Yes, that was my purple carrots. I know from the camera, it probably looks a little darker, but these are, these are very, very purple when you cut into them and uh, that bright sort of orange yellow in the middle. Yeah. They're very sweet, I think. Yes, I, I like I like them for that reason. But the, there's also the variety I think we talked about it earlier that purple all the way through, which you can find too. It's a darker purple, believe it or not. It's a darker purple than that one, but uh, but it, it's that's a lovely one also. Yeah. It comes out a little black, I think, sometimes when it gets cooked. It, yeah, it's still delicious. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the carrots don't bleed out. These carrots don't bleed out the no. way that beets do. Right. Which is why, if you're going to do beets, you definitely want to do beets on their own. Um, yeah, but anyway, what a beautiful, you know, beautiful array of, of colors for the winter as well. You know, it's really, they're quite remarkable. So enjoy and eat them, stay healthy, build, boost your immune system. We all need that right now. Thanks for the emojis. Great. Thanks for the yes. emojis. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and jump into Adrian's recipe. Yeah. Okay, so my turn at, yes. at the hub here. Um, uh, so pumpkins, and I mean, there's so many things you can do with pumpkin and winter squash. You can use them in desserts, and, which is what my favorite way of doing them, actually. Um, <laughs> but the, what's intimidating about these things, especially something as large as a, as as, a, as one of these kabokas, or this is a relatively small pumpkin size. It was actually a pie pumpkin um, that I cut up earlier, and I use them uh, for this recipe. But when it's this intimidating. Um, you know, what a lot of people are, are going to just say, you know, I can't deal with it. And I'm just going to go for, you know, something that's easier to cut. And I get it because this is, it's a little dangerous. Um, there's my knife. Let's do the, oh, could you bring over my squashes? I'm sorry, I totally forgot about those. <laughs> I've got this, the ones that are already prepped here. There we go. I use, uh, we talked about knives earlier. I, I just use a, an eight inch um, French um you know, just a, a, a good French knife, an eight inch, this is an eight inch knife. And um, so this is one of the ones that the kaboka that I've, that I've already prepped. So what you do is you just take it and just place it on a, on a, on a, um, a cookie sheet or something that will hold the uh, juices in while it's cooking. And let me move this out of the way here. And you spear it around the top. So it's not, I mean, it's not that you don't need a knife for this, but it's pretty easy to just do this. Yeah, that might be nice if we could see the overhead view of what you're doing too. Okay. Thanks. I wasn't sure she was ready to take it all on the other. Um, I'm going to switch you over now, folks. Danielle's a techie here. I'm not. There we go. There Wonderful. We go. Thank you. The knife that I use. And Danielle, uh, Danielle's uh, big knife wouldn't work for this, so you do need one with a point, obviously. 
but um, if you were to cut it, her knife would be great. And I also use this one to cut. But anyway, I'm spearing it around the top. This lets out the steam. And what will happen also is some of the interior juices will bubble up through here. And it'll drip down on the outside a little bit. But uh, it, it's a good way to release the steam. That's, it's important to do that before you put it in. Um, so uh, this one is all prepped. Another way of doing it, another way of doing this, if you want, is to put it, do the same thing, to do the knife points around it. And put it in the, in the microwave. I prefer to do it in the oven because it just seems to have a better, it has more of a baked kind of flavor to it. I did do the pumpkin that way uh, last night and it came out just fine. Uh, and also there's another option would be to do, to do an acorn squash. So these are the different things you could use for this particular recipe. I'm, the recipe uh, today focuses on kaboka, but I've also got a, a half of a acorn squash that I cooked uh, in the oven this morning, and we're going to add that to our mix. So um, this is all done. It's been in the oven for uh, about 45 minutes. Now this is another thing. Thank you for the emoji. Um, <laughs> the other thing that I want to mention is that the, the the recipe says to cook it for an hour, but that's more for a large pumpkin, larger pumpkin than this one. So I mean, uh, kaboka. This one, so more like a two or three pounder, you probably want to do an hour. But if it's smaller than that, start checking it after 30 minutes, and you might find yourself taking it out really very soon after 30 minutes, about half the time that I've mentioned in the recipe. So we're going to just cut this open, see what it looks like. It's and so soft. It is soft, but it's not so soft that it's falling apart. Look at that beautiful flesh on the inside. It's almost the same color as the uncooked flesh. It's got a really deep orangey to it, rather than the more yellowish color of, of the uh, acorn, which uh, is lighter. And so it's a nice contrasting version of this. When you're doing multiple different kinds of, 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 of squashes in this recipe, you will, thank you, you will wind up with a nice array of colors, but you don't have to, obviously. We're just going to pull out the, the seeds. It's a great source of fiber in all these vegetables yeah, today. I know. I know. These are really sweet and delicious. And we're going to do on this one too. And so could you do this in advance uh, rather than, um, you know, having it to do it now? Well, of course you can, but that would involve having to cut that kaboka open, which is what we're trying to avoid. If you prefer, you could definitely do it, cut it open, take the seeds out first, and then pop these in the oven for considerably less than an hour because it'll only take about 20 minutes to cook them in the oven once they're opened up. So that's another, another aspect to this as far as the cooking is concerned. All right. So... Um, these are ones that actually are done, and we need to put them on here because I'm going to need this, right? I'm going to need this kind of this. So do you want to put those in there? Thank you. We're about to get our pan. There we go. Thank you. Another, we, we're getting another piece of parchment paper coming. So just put it on a small, put these on a small pan after you after you cut them open like this, but let me show you how. Um, so there's a couple of things. One of them is to tear them apart. And you know, these days, it seems to be very much in, in fashion to have very rustic, rough kind of looking pieces of, of food. I mean, for bread and things like that, they always say tear this apart or, or for- That's for the new fad. Tortillas, look. yeah, when you're making tortillas, just tear apart. The, um, the the uh, cru uh, the crust the uh, skin on these is um, actually edible. A lot of people don't like it, so just you know leave it so that there's enough that they can actually take it off if they want to. So we're just going to do some torn, and we're going to do some that's going to be cut. You'll see the difference. This is actually doesn't really have enough flesh on it to really uh, warrant doing it twice, co do cooking it again. But we'll just leave that out. But the ones that have lots of flesh, the areas that have that are very fleshy. You want to go ahead and put those on your on your um, cookie sheet or baking sheet, and then let's just set this aside here for a second and 
So then we're just going to cut this one. You just, you just see the difference. I mean, you've done this before, I'm sure, but we're just going to do a comparison. And you can Adrian decide. is the terror, and I'm the cutter. I'm a terror. <laughs> I'm a real terror. <laughs> But you see how much neater and nicer these are now. So this just depends on your personality, really. What do you want to go for? You want to go for the kind of, you know, kind of organic look, or you want to go for more the, the more the 50s look? The 50s look, yes. yeah. No, some of them come right out, which is fine, you know. So we've got the, the uh, peel behind, and no problem there. All right. Uh, so as you're prepping. Can I just interject a question here? There's a, a, a question if you could use butternut squash or pumpkin for this recipe. Yes. Oh, yes. You absolutely can. I, I have lots of options. I have I have uh, the acorn squash here that you can use for it. And um, there's um, there's one that's already done that we're using pumpkin for as well as the acorn squash. Uh, I think the curry is probably the most, um, it's in and of itself, the sweetest of the three. The red curry and the mm -hmm. green curry. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. K U R I spelled K U R I, not curry as in the dish. And the curry and the kabocha are very closely related. Yes, um, they're almost to me they're almost indistinguishable. I know that there's probably a difference, and it could have to do more than anything else, maybe with the final texture. But the flavor is very similar, and the way you cook it's going to be virtually identical. Um, so here again. We've got the, I always keep the skins on my acorn squash because I think it makes it really nice to have the option of being able to eat those skins, which I like a lot. I take the bottom off here, little knob here, the, the, or the base of the, that's a little tough. Yeah, that's then, like a seed almost at the bottom. Yeah, and then we're gonna be putting, um, putting these on the plate too, on the, so you got a really pretty combination of, yeah, of yellow and orange. We do. So let's set this aside. This over here. Put that out of the way. Mm -hmm. And our next step is um, to make the um, make the sauce. So we're gonna do. Can you switch it over? Yeah. I, I think what I want to do here is just. Um, why don't you, if there are any questions for Adrian? Are there any questions at this point? We're gonna, this is gonna be a maple syrup sauce. And um, we've got everything prepped to, get to, to, to do the second roast. As, as you're prepping, um, is the final cooked squash peel edible or you just eat the inside of it? I like to eat it, my husband won't eat it. So it really is a matter of preference. It does provide some extra fiber for you if you, if you're, if you tend to, to go for these kinds of things. It will be, I will show you when I pull the, the, um, the, the final finished product that the, that the skin is nice and crisp. So it could almost act like almost like a nice counter punch to the softness of the, of the squash on the inside. And it, it provides a nice texture. So I like it and it's absolutely edible. It is totally edible. It's just subjective. In terms of yeah, whether yeah. you're actually going to eat it. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to go to the stove for just a second so I can do my little... There we go. All right, so we're gonna go for a half a cup of maple syrup. And if you don't wanna use maple syrup, you could use um, brown sugar or coconut sugar, which is a very nice option because it's got loads of the flavor, like the maple syrup. It's got more flavor than, than the brown sugar. I'm just gonna do a half a cup of this. And then we're gonna take a look at our, our um, these are our different peppers. So I've got the red of the, um, this is the Fresno pepper, and the heat volume, the heat, what would you call it? The heat uh, metric on this one is, is, is pretty high. It's almost as high as the Serrano, which is right next to it. And <clears throat> the highest of all, of course, is habanero. This is the orange, round orange one. that looks like a little pumpkin, a little baby pumpkin. And um, these are very, very, uh, very high in heat. So if you really like your heat, you could go for this. But I tend to stay more to the slightly less, uh, but these are still very spicy. So I'm gonna use the Fresno because it's just a pretty color and it'll look pretty on my squash. So we're just gonna cut this up. So. 
and it calls for two or three, but um, I stick with one. And that looked to me like it was plenty. But if you like it really spicy, you can definitely go for the higher numbers. Okay, and then also I just want to mention while I'm cutting this up, is I did make a small typo here, significant small typo. Let me turn this on now. On your recipe? On my recipe. I made a small typo. Thank you. Um, vanilla. This is just plain pure vanilla extract. And I said in the recipe, I think I what, what printed out was a tablespoon of vanilla. Well, you don't want a tablespoon of vanilla. You want a teaspoon of vanilla. So this is the tablespoon size. And this is the whoop, teaspoon size. And that's what we're going to put in here, the teaspoon size. And this is going to come to a boil. And put that right in there. I mean, if you want to add more vanilla, you're certainly welcome to do so. If you like that vanilla flavor and you want to enhance it, you can absolutely, uh, it won't hurt it to add more. It just is, it tends to get a little overwhelming, over, not overwhelming, but overpowering, uh, which is a little different because that makes it just, the, the, you can't taste the, the other flavors if you've got too much. But I definitely would um, consider it if you, if you want to. I liked it at the, at the, um, Oops, whoops. I liked it at the um, one tablespoon level. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm going to try to get this higher. You want it really bubbly. Here. Ingredients are going to be uh, over maple here. syrup. There's the maple syrup. Vanilla, your hot pepper. Yeah, let's put a couple of these. I'll just put these right up on here so you can see them all. This is about to start boiling, I hope. Turn it on high, which is what it's on right now. And then you're going to add your one third cup. Oh, we've forgotten salt. Salt. <laughs> I like my salt. <laughs> Lots of salt. <clears throat> uh -huh. And this is also kosher salt. And I'm going to do a large pinch. So that looks to me like maybe two pinches. There we go. If you're trying to, you know, hold the salt down, you don't have to put any in, of course. And that's not a problem. It'll still be delicious. But we do like salted sweet. Our sweet and salty combos are always very well. Healthy. You know, the, you know, this is a very uh, fall wintry combination yeah. with the vanilla, complementing the sweetness of the of the uh, maple syrup, and you know, tying into the sweet, gorgeous winter squash. I mean, you. Can't go wrong with that kind of combination. This is your oil. A little bit of olive oil. Olive oil. You don't use the seasoned oil for this because we're going in a different direction with these flavors. Yeah, I think with the garlic and everything in that, well, you wouldn't want to have the seasoned no. olive oil. No. I mean, you know, you could give it a try and see if you like it. But I, I, I think it's a, it might be a little bit of a waste of a very nicely flavored olive oil to use yeah. it in something like this. Yeah. But we're just going to stir this really well so that it's almost, um, well, it won't actually get get really fully uh, combined the way you would with the salad dressing. And then we're going to just turn this off. And that's pretty much it. Just let it sit there in the hot pan and keep stirring it. And it should thicken up a little bit as you do that. And this, we're going to pour on our... Are you going to hold it for me? Are you going to hold it for me? Yes, you're hard. You're so helpful. Well, I try. I know. And I need my hot bag. Here we go. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. There we go. We're just going to pour that on. Like so. And this is going to be the second baking of, of the... Uh, of the squash. Of the squash. And actually, I like to put it in the... I like to bake it to get the, the bottom of that nice and crispy, you know, the, the, the actual um, skin of it. But then I stick it under the broiler. Um, so we're doing a little of each. So why don't we, can we see that? Yep. Okay, can great. see that? 
And then it's going to go in. The <laughs> it's going to go in the broiler. Put it down below the water. Okay. And magically, so are you are you baking this right now, or are you broiling it right now? Well, it's it's, it's on broil because we got to switch it back to baking. <laughs> but we should be baking it right now. Do you want to bake it? Great. Thank you for well, the clarification. It's fine. It's kind of on a. It's it's on a. It's in a hot in an oven that's been heating hot for about the yeah, last hour. Yeah, but it's hour. not under the broiler. Even though we're on broiler mode, but it's in the bottom of the. There we go. It's in the bottom. Okay, so here we've got the the fully baked. Uh, can you see it? Okay. Do you want to do you want to do the overhead? You want to switch back to. Yeah, let's switch it back real quick to the overhead because what I'm going to do is put a little bit more of the sauce on this. Okay. Just for a moment, and then we'll come back at you for the last five minutes. And take all the questions. I just want to show you how nice and dark and crispy the bottoms came out. See, I mean, look at that. It's beautiful. What, you can you hold that up to camera a little bit so we can see it? Thanks. Come up closer to here. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this. Is that better? Yes. Can you see that? See how beautiful those come out? I mean, what's not to love about eating something like this, right? People are gonna love this skin. It's all covered with maple syrup and it's gleaming and shiny. And it's just exactly what you want. You just pop this into your mouth and you get the whole effect of the soft squash and the caramelized bottom. And you're gonna put it in a 450 oven. So it's actually gonna be quite hot when you put it in the oven. And that's how you get this caramelization. And even this one, which is a larger one, and this is part of my um, acorn squash that I actually didn't even cut. I just cut it in half. It's got some of the caramelization on the bottom also. So this is what you're getting. And um, I, this, I sort of went sparingly on the, on the sauce when I put it in. So I'm just gonna add a little bit more. Um, and we're gonna just use this one right here. Oh, there's that too, yeah. You can use this. So before yeah. you serve it, you know, you can just sprinkle a little more on there. But do taste it before you do all this because if it's very spicy, you may want to just keep it, you know, a little more low key. And it depends a lot on the pepper that you use. And so, so that's it. And would you put any um would you put any like mint or any green? Sure, absolutely. Um Mint would be wonderful with this. Uh, in fact, I think that's a, that's a perfect answer for mm -hmm. you. But you know, you could also uh, do a little, you could also sprinkle a little very finely chopped rosemary on top. Rosemary, I, you know, it's funny, because I was gonna say, if you were to use an infused oil, I would go with one that had the rosemary in it. Yeah. I was gonna su suggest that you earlier, but then, back. then we just decided to uh, hold, hold off on those infused oils on this one. So anyway. So Great um, Thank you, Mike. while we're switching back, Adrian, you had mentioned the heat level on yeah. uh, the in the sauce. Someone yeah. asked, uh, you know, if they can't, if you can't handle spicy, what's a good substitute for the chili in this? Oh, um, if you can't handle the heat, then just don't put the chilies in. Then get out of the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That would be the obvious answer. <laughs> you are familiar with that quote, I hope. Um, can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Uh, um, no, I think that you could put some herbs in there um, uh, and uh, maybe some um, like little onion, uh, the scallion browns, which would serve the same purpose in terms of the decorative aspect of it. Um, so scallion, chop the, the green part of the scallion, to chop, cut into rounds would be nice. That would give it a nice flavor. But you know, just you can just uh, just leave it out. Yeah, That's the other option. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, Danielle, someone asked if you can make ice cubes with the oil mixture to use them at a later date. Is that something that you think would be possible to do? Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great yeah. idea. It's freeze, a... freeze the oil in the ice cube tray. Yes. That's yeah. excellent. Very, very creative use of that. Absolutely. And then I pop them out and put them in a bag and keep them in the bag in the freezer so I can reuse my my uh, ice cube tray for something else. So yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, we did have a question here. It's slightly off topic, but I think it, it relates to the vegetable idea. The, um, someone wants to know if it's possible or how you would roast vegetables if they're using yogurt. Do you have any ideas or thoughts on that? 
roasting That's vegetables right. in yogurt. Yogurt, roasting vegetables in yogurt. Um, I think you definitely could do that. I think it would, it would, it would be, it would wind up being more of the. You might want to use a full fat yogurt, um, but you probably it'd probably be more the water and the yogurt that would be doing the cooking rather than the actual. You no, know, you'd get some of the effect. Of you the, would get, you yeah. would get a little bit of the kind of the curdling of the the. the creaminess of the yeah. yogurt on there mm -hmm. because you know a lot of uh, there are recipes with um, um chicken marinated in yogurt yes that's that's, that's baked off you put so, that on the grill and it's terrific yeah yes. right yeah so, so you could definitely yeah yeah i mean it would be it might be a little messier and trickier to deal with than a, than a chicken breast for example but i think you could we love it. messy messy's good <laughs> messy's good yeah and then one last question here. Could sweet potatoes work in this recipe as well? Oh, yeah. Either they're of these? So yeah. Fast. yeah. 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 Uh, in, in, uh, is the question in regards to the squash recipe? Oh, the squash. I think, I think in either recipe, yeah. Either one, yeah. They're going to cook fast. Uh, so you definitely want to, uh, if you're going to put them in the oven, do it Do it in their jackets whole and, you know, do the, do the uh, poke them with a, a, a fork rather than a knife. And um, and cook them for maybe 20 minutes, depending on their size. It's not gonna it's not gonna take long for those to cook. And then you can follow the rest of this, and then you know get them broiled or or you know caramelized at, at the high heat uh, for the second part. For this, you probably want to cook them separately from everything. I, I I agree. I would cook them separately. I would leave the skins on, and I would try it as wedges rather than rounds because I think they'll hold their shape better because. They do get very tender and very soft. Um, the flesh of it does. So yeah, definitely, I would keep the skin on just to serve as sort of a boat. But Great. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Well, I just want to thank you both for being here with us today. This has been a wonderful presentation. It's been a delight to have you, and yeah, also to everyone who's joined us along the way as well today. We've got some great comments and wonderful wonderful questions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.